Come, come, whoever you are. You are welcome here. No matter your age, your size, the color of your <laughs> the color of your eyes, your hair, your skin, you are welcome here. No matter your gender, whom you love, how you speak, or whatever your abilities, you are welcome here. You are welcome here, whether you come with laughter in your heart or tears in your eyes, you are welcome here. No matter what you have experienced in the past, no matter what awaits you in the future, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God all of the time or some of the time or none of the time, you're welcome here. This is a community of open minds, loving hearts, and willing hands. You are welcome here at South Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. Please rise for our open singing. We'll be in the Grammy Tenaltish Country Line for the community. <laughs> And let's keep it going. We're going to sing 395 also, so keep standing up. We got two songs in a row here. Raise the roof a little bit here.
You may be seated. That was excellent. We're still learning how to sing post pandemic. Good morning. I am the Reverend Laura Young and my pronouns are she, her and hers. And I am so glad to see all of you here in the sanctuary and those of you at home in our virtual audience. We bid you a warm, hug filled welcome into this shared space of worship. We would like to extend an especially warm welcome to any of those who are here with us this morning in person or online for the first time. If you'd like to get us, like, like to get us, like to get us, I cannot say that. If you want to know us a little bit better, I suggest you fill out our connection card. It is uh, in the online order of service. There's a link there, and you can also find it uh, in the QR code um, at the back of the sanctuary. We do have a religious education program, and Rob Carlson is our director of religious exploration. Are you ready? You can just wave your hand there. In a few weeks, our programming will be starting for the fall, um, and we encourage all families to sign up and register your families as a way of helping us make sure that you are on Rob's email list. There is a lot happening here at South Valley, and our weekly newsletter is called Happenings, and if you haven't subscribed to that, I encourage you to do that. If you don't regularly read it, you should. A couple brief announcements. Our camp out is returning for the first time in three years. Our annual camp out will be at Payson Lakes Campground, Group Site A, next weekend, Saturday through Monday. Please see Kathleen Luck. Um, she's been sending out emails and uh, posting it to the listserv um, for how to uh, sign up and do the camping. And if you're not a camper, you might just come for Sunday and uh, enjoy the day with us out there. There will not be worship in the sanctuary that morning, um, and there will not be Zoom because there is no electricity at the campsite to provide that for us. Sunday, September 11th, uh, will be our in-gathering water communion. It will be our final 9.30 a.m. service, and it will be our final uh, summer service over at Murray Park. After that, we'll be returning to in-sanctuary, services uh, because the weather will eventually change on us and we'll be starting at 10 30 which is our normal time so you can all breathe a sigh of relief you can breathe and you can sleep in a little bit more on a sunday morning water ceremony is at 9 30 so you have today at 9 30 next weekend at payson get there 9 30 10 ish more casual start because it's a campground and then the following weekend 9 30 September 11th, and back to 10.30 here for the duration. Let's take a moment now to fully arrive. Welcome one another. Take a moment to greet those who are standing, sitting, and present beside you.
Let us now light our chalice. I'll wait for my little volunteers. We're trying to look little, but are not actually little. <laughs> I invite all of you to stand in body, mind, or spirit as we say our chalice lighting words and use our actions if you want. Those at home are invited to light a chalice and share in this ritual by entering chalices lit in the name of your street. We'll wait for them to light the first match. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, for the light of truth, and the energy of action. <laughs> Thank you. You may be seated. As we gather this morning, let us do so with mindfulness, for we gather on land that has been inhabited by the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes for many, many generations. We acknowledge the complex history and the violence that was done to these native peoples in these lands at the policies promoted and, in, and kept alive by, by colonialist settlers. We commit ourselves to undoing harm and we seek to authentically and with honesty engage in the necessary work that will undo those harms, bring justice, and re-enfranchise those who continue to live and love and be in this land. Let us now share in our call to worship. This morning, Dion and Denna will be delivering that for us. a ritual to read to each other. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others may, may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each other elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the circus can't find the park. I call it cruel and maybe the root of all cruelty to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to, to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. At this time, I'd like to invite any of our young people and the young at heart to join me up front. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. So good to see all of you. Okay. <laughs> 
Good morning. Good morning, Max. Good morning. Hi, Ruthie. Good morning. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad to see all of you this morning. Glad to be here with you. You know something that I've noticed about people? Sometimes people think that just because they've uh, seen someone or they've met someone one time, uh, that they know pretty much all of the important things that there is to know about that person. Even if maybe they've talked to uh, someone new for a little bit, they think, oh, I, I know this person pretty well. Do you think that's always true? No, no probably not. Because why? How, how do we get to know someone better? What do, we, what do we need to do to get to know someone better? What do you think, Tiella? We need to talk to them. What are the things that we need to talk, to, talk about to get to know someone more, do you think? The things that they like? Yeah, what else? Yeah. What's their name? Oh, that's an important one. What's their name? You know, that's something that can sometimes be embarrassing for me when I'm meeting new people and I forget to ask that very basic question. And then it becomes uncomfortable when I have to go back and either admit or try to hide that I don't know that person's name. Oh, that's so important. Names are so important. Yes, you all have named some really wonderful things. In order to really know someone, you have to know of some of their experiences. And in, in sharing back and forth, you, you get to really know more about what a person's like. And we know that in our country's history, we had a time when people would buy and sell other people because they thought that other people, certain people with a certain color skin, weren't really so much people. They were things, right? We know this, yeah, slavery, exactly. And this was a horrible time in our history. And, you know, I wonder about some of the stories of people who whose names we might know, um, but whose backgrounds, families, we, we don't really know anything about. And so this is a, just a very uh, short story, I guess you could say, from the point of view of a slave named Betty. And so I wonder if you all, when you hear this story that she is telling, uh, I wonder if you could think about what are some of the ways that she is telling us about who she is. So Betty says, I am a special flower gardener and I do the regular cleaning in the big house. So that's the, the master's house of the plantation. She's working there. Of course, she's not getting paid to work there and she's not being treated well. I do the regular cleaning. Under Miss Fairchild's direction, I set all of the flower arrangements and I help with, with all the decorating inside the house. And my work has made this house a model of beauty and comfort. And this makes me feel strong to be able to do this for other people, to design their gardens and bring style to their homes. This makes me feel strong to know that I have the talent to decorate a home, to know my love of nature, reveals to me inviting garden paths. I like to tell my brothers and sisters that it is our special talents that we often loan to others that has made the Fairchild estate, the big house, what it is. It's ours. My encouraging words warm every heart and we embrace one another in love singing softly the comforting words, freedom, oh freedom. What is Betty trying to tell us about the kind of person that she is? What are some of the things that you heard that she is proud of? Yeah. She's proud that she is very to the people who are 
yeah, she, she's proud that she's able to help, even though the circumstances are, are terrible, right? What else? She's talking about her gifts. Yeah. And do you suppose that the people who she was working for truly recognized these gifts and thanked her? Or did they just kind of probably think that, well, that's what she needs to be doing? Probably that one, right? In this story, I'm hearing so many wonderful things that, uh, that Betty is trying to tell us about her and her family that we would never, ever know. And even this story is a bit of an imagined story from the author of this book. The author of this book found names of actual slaves, of actual people on different manuscripts, but created this story for these people because we will probably never know their stories. And that's really sad, I think. So I think today it is really important that part of getting to know someone and part of being a community is sharing our stories and listening to the stories and experiences of others because it helps all of us grow, right? Well, I'm so glad that all of you are here this morning. If you'd like, you can come out. We have our, our playground time. We also uh, normally uh, would, would have childcare on Sunday, but our, our uh, a child care person is is not feeling well so if anyone has you know a, a young person maybe two to five ish years old um we just ask that if you would like a more quiet space downstairs in the child care room that um that you attend down there um with your kids uh, but otherwise you're welcome to stay up here you're welcome to come out on the playground and yeah we're ready let's go <laughs> This community, our church, and our many ministries are made possible by the gifts of your time, your talent, and your treasure. It is our practice at South Valley to share our worship service offerings with a charitable organization that aligns with our values. For July and August, our youngest religious exploration students uh, picked Hawk Watch which is an advocacy organization for research on raptors and uh, restoration of their uh, homeland. Please give generously in support of our Earth's precious interdependent web that our young religious explorers here at South Valley um, have brought to our attention. Please join me in reading our offertory words. They are in your uh, online order of service. We are this church. We are its hands, its heart, its voice. Together we share the wealth of this community and sustain it with our gifts. I would invite our board greeters to come forward at this time. Or any board members that are happy to be here. I invite you just to take this time as a moment of reflection and pause to open and prepare your hearts for the ritual to come of sharing our joys and sorrows. Let these gifts given to Hawk Watch and to South Valley be a blessing on our community. And may the love that is represented here unfold in new and surprising ways. Let us join in our ritual of joys and sorrows here at the table. The stones here are for you to select and place in the water in a time of silent reflection. 
Those gathered at home are encouraged to use the chat box to share with one another at this time, that which is in your heart. Feel free to pause as you select your stone and gently place it in the water. At the close of our ritual, we will add one final stone to represent those joys and sorrows unexpressed, but still held in kindness. Join me now. that which remains unexpressed, but still felt in the heart. May all the joys and sorrows blend now into the common core of the heart of this congregation, be met with kindness and find healing. Let us extend this time of silence just a bit more with a practice of intentional meditation. This morning we will practice for two minutes. Our practice will expand in the months to come until we may hold four minutes with one another. For those of you who are comfortable closing your eyes during meditation, you are invited to do so. For those for whom that does not feel comfortable, feel free to leave your eyes open. A common way of meditating is to breathe in and breathe out and to notice the breath. And again, for some of us being asked to breathe into the bodies we inhabit can feel difficult. So perhaps you would like to just open and close your hand. Let us begin.
recall that meditation is not about having a blank mind. You could do that. But what would be the point? The purpose of meditation is to notice the mind and bring it back to this moment. Wandering is what the mind does. May it be so. Our work, our work is perpetually unfinished because we are always arriving, always evolving, always becoming ourselves anew. Knowing this can free us from the expectation of some point of arrival wherein we will finally and fully have ourselves together enough to be worthy. Considering ourselves to be worthy enough to participate in the dance of life. There is a voice in our minds that may whisper, we will never be worthy. And thus our work remains feeling unfinished. Despite the fact that there is no perpetual end or beginning on this journey does not mean there are no points of arrival along the way. And it does not mean that enlightenment, that big and complex word, is my microphone not working properly? Should I use this one for now? Okay, all right. It does not mean that enlightenment, a big and sort of scary word that's bandied around in our culture, which just means simply noticing that the lights are on, that's all, just noticing that the lights are on. Does not mean that enlightenment is necessarily out of reach. It just means that this invitation to grow in our awareness, to build our skills for listening, and expand our ability to be kind and compassionate people is the work of a lifetime. This paradox invites us to realize that we are both on a journey to wholeness and already whole. When I began theological school in the fall of 2013, I could not have imagined all the becoming that was in store for me. And truthfully, I probably would have run the other way had I understood just what the decade ahead would require of me. As I stand on the threshold of a new decade, I'm deeply aware of the paradox I just described. I'm also reminded of a phrase that was given to me years ago that goes like this. Whatever is in the way of the work is the work. Whatever is in the way of the work is the work. I offer this phrase this morning and hope that it will invite you to gently arrive to the shores of awareness. As a community, we are on a journey. For 40 years, 2023, 1983, this congregation has been gathering to explore, to learn, and grow more skillful as individual human beings and as a people dedicated to a set of shared values in the world. Time and again, South Valley has shown up for the work and sought to grow and learn and become a reflection of our shared values of love and justice. We are a community that does hard things on purpose together because we know that this is how we remain connected to one another. How we avoid becoming a club of nice people and instead foster a community of kindness and bring forth the beloved community, a community rich in justice and overflowing with love. Just now, 
We are deeply and vividly aware of our need to grow more skillful as a congregation in, wel in welcoming and supporting and journeying with our siblings of color. As a predominantly white congregation and a predominantly white association of congregations, this means that the work is often and primarily around understanding how power and privilege function in individual bodies and in systems and cultures of the church as a whole. It is difficult to change something that is often outside of our awareness, but that is exactly the work that is before us. It is in the way of the work we would perhaps rather do. Whatever is in the way of the work is the work. In the aftermath of our administrator's departure, in large part due to microaggressions based on gender and age and race, many of you have expressed deep sadness, regret, confusion, even anger. How could we? A community dedicated to justice, equity, and inclusion have fallen so short. Some asked, have we not read How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi? Yes, we have. Had I talked about microaggressions from the pulpit? Yes, I have. Others wondered if perhaps there were just a few bad apples in our midst. No, this is not about blame and shame. It's about building awareness in each of us and in changing systems. And many of us, myself included in large part, wanted immediately to jump to solutions and actions to root out this pernicious evil in our midst. Whatever is in the way of the work is the work. Engagement with racial justice is a primary work of Unitarian Universalist congregations in this time and in this place. It intersects with all of the other work. We are called to show up and make real the promises of our faith movement from generations past and to be a site for healing and empowerment now and going forward. We don't have to do this work all alone, and we do not have to travel this path with, in isolation with our only companions being guilt on one side and shame on the other. We instead can choose a new path of collaboration, cooperation, humility, and deep listening. We can instead listen deeply to our black and brown and indigenous siblings who have already prophesied, already delineated, already outlined, and already engaged in the academic and social listening required to bring about true and lasting change. Our role here as a congregation is to listen. And because we have been socialized against listening in so many ways, we may find ourselves in a place of needing to learn anew skills for listening. It can sound so simple when we state it like this, that racial justice, equity, inclusion, and a love of diversity can be accomplished through the act of listening. But that is a foundational truth for listening deeply and with awareness of the other before us is a radical act of liberation. When we listen deeply to another, we are gifted with the awareness that this beautiful and sacred human being before us is both exactly the same and wholly different from us. In theological circles, we refer to this as the radical respect for the alterity of the other. A radical respect for the alterity of the other. It holds as true that we share a common humanity and a radically different set of identities, experiences, perspectives, and stories. When we expand our listening to whole communities of people different from ourselves, perhaps in race and ethnicity, communities that have had to bear terrible burdens, survive trauma and daily humiliations for the color of their skin, we begin to move into a radically different space where liberation is not just possible, 
but even probable. When I was a student at Iliff School of Theology, I had the opportunity to study with Dr. Edward Antonio, who was a native of Zimbabwe and the chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Program at Iliff. I traveled with Dr. Antonio and his wife, also Dr. Antonio, to Southern Africa in the fall of 2015 for a social justice immersion program. While we visited cultural sites and toured villages and townships, schools and markets, the real work was in understanding our social location as American theological students visiting Africa. As a group, we were vested with privilege, citizenship in the United States, access to education, democratic governance and the rule of law, and things that seem so pedestrian, like regular electricity and water. We were also a diverse group, racially, religiously, sexually, and with different gender identities. And the, trick, and the trip quickly revealed the intersection and the pain of this intersectionality in American culture. Our group split over an incident into two camps, black and Christian folks in one camp and non-Christian mixed race polyamorous white folks in the other. For two and a half weeks, we traveled together struggling to figure out what had gone wrong and how we might get back on track. Despite repeated listening sessions, including one with the president of ILIF who joined us for a few days, many late night conversation and education opportunities and even outright pleas from our leaders to find common ground once more, our group never really recovered. A listening session offered six months later was poorly attended. It's been almost seven years and I am still sorrowfully aware of how difficult it is to do this work for a group of highly educated, progressive, faithful theological students could not find their way to deep listening. The trauma and the intersectionality overwhelmed us. So I do not approach this conversation as your minister about inviting you to deep listening to heal racial injustice with a Pollyanna expectation of some imminent arrival to a well-lit space of joyful renewal. I understand from my own experience that this work requires much more than I bargained for. The journey to wholeness is one that requires we shed the illusion, the illusion of safety and ease and comfort and in turn, in return for the arrival of wholeheartedness, wholeheartedness. That word that has been made popular by sociologist Brene Brown, who defines wholeheartedness as this, an engagement with our lives from a place of worthiness. Wholeheartedness means cultivating the courage and compassion and connection to wake up in the morning and think, no matter what gets done and how much is left undone, I am enough. She writes, it's going to bed at night and thinking, yes, I am imperfect and vulnerable and sometimes afraid, but that doesn't change the truth that I am also brave of worthy and worthy of love and belonging. Wholeheartedness. This is the place we shall root our work of bringing about beloved community. And covenant will be our roadmap. As a covenantal community, a community bound together by a set of shared promises and commitments to one another, rather than a shared doctrine and set of creeds, as Unitarian Universalists, we are uniquely positioned to undertake this work. We already understand our communities to be places where we journey through the world together. 
As a congregation, we are not just another organization to join and get busy with, though many a UU congregation has burned themselves out doing just that. We can be a place where we find companions to travel with and learn skills for our shared journey. At its core, covenant is about deep listening to our deepest selves, to one another, and to needs greater than our own. Being in covenant means slowing down to consider the inherent worth and dignity of all human beings, including ourselves as primary. In doing so, covenanting requires that we set healthy boundaries on purpose so that our interactions create understanding and connection, which in turn lead to healing. Reverend Scott Taylor, founder of Soul Matters, a subscription service which we subscribe to, which is for Unitarian Universalist congregations, has offered that Unitarian Universalists have a core theology, and that that core theology is this. We have a theology of healing disconnection. We have a theology of healing disconnection. The beauty of this theology of healing disconnection is its openness. When you walk in the door, you are already whole. And you are invited to continue on a journey to wholeness. We do not require brokenness to be admitted before God in order to receive healing. We rather approach healing as universally and unconditionally available and predictably possible given loving circumstances and sufficient time. In this theology, we are mindful that healing takes place in its own way, on its own time, and that our role is to support its unfolding in ourselves, others, and the wider world. A theology of healing disconnection is a theology of reconnection to self, other, and the world. The first step is reestablishing that connection with ourselves, noticing where the disconnect has happened in our own bodies and in our own lives. And that requires listening to the deepest parts of ourselves. From there, this theology invites us to open ourselves to enjoy in the gifts of life, to partake in the joys of shared life and common values, and then to turn our attention to serving needs greater than our own. This is not a linear path, though it sounds like that when I say it that way. This is not a linear path wherein we just listen once to ourselves and then go off and serve the world's troubles. This theological process is more like a set of questions we return to at life's thresholds, a set of inquiries designed to take us out of our normal states and normal patterns of thinking so that we may understand ourselves and one another more intimately as we move along life's pathways. And that is my call to us as a congregation as we stand on the threshold of this year. Let us bond together to heal our disconnections. Let us commit again to the work of liberation, healing, and yes, salvation. Those three synonyms synonyms, not synonyms, this trinity of hope that can bind us together to create the world that we know is possible. Again, this work is not a single point of arrival, and it is not a utopian vision of a static, perfect harmony. It is more like a wild and precious garden. As we tend to it, it blooms and produces but the goal is not to have forever fruit. It is rather to listen and to attend to the whole cycle and support the health 
of the whole as it moves through the seasons of change and the gardeners themselves change, who in their own time and attention also grow and bloom and pass on their learning to the generations to come. We bloom and then we pass away. This work is also like that. Now is our time to bloom and then to let that work go to the next generation. But right now, it is our time. And it is a good time. It is a good time at South Valley and a good time in Unitarian Universalism to renew our commitments to love and justice after a long and difficult three years of a pandemic that may yet still rear its head. Of course, we all know that we'll just knock on wood. This fall, we have a chance to be together anew and to find each other again and again as we walk this path of covenant. As we launch into this fall with new programs, I encourage you and invite you to consider what does your heart need now? What does this congregation offer to you that you might offer back? And what are the needs that are greater than your own that you feel uniquely and deeply called to answer? It is that discernment bowl we spoke about some weeks ago to put those questions in the middle and to trust the answers that arise from deep within us. A point I will place out for our congregation around racial justice is the start of our anti-racism task force. This congregation has had a long history of engaging in racial justice, but during the pandemic, we were not as able to gather. And so now we are beginning again to gather an anti-racism task force. Many of you in this room and online have already said yes to that work and thank you. That group will begin to uh, discern its work in the coming weeks and you'll be, be in hearing from them in the fall and winter. Part of the invitation for that work is to consider the adoption of an eighth principle to our current seven principles. Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism has created and promoted the adoption of this eighth principle as a, as a beckoning for us towards greater awareness and engagement with this work. The eighth principle reads as thus, we the members of the congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Associations convent covenant, there's that word again, covenant, to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. This is the work we can be called for. The path is covenant and the process is deep listening. We have both the energy and the means to do this work before us. We only need to dedicate ourselves to the act of deep listening and trust that from there, we will find our way home. May it be so, and amen. Let us now extinguish our chalice. I have a volunteer that wants to come and blow out the candle. That would be awesome. We extinguish this chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. We hold each other in our hearts until we meet again. Please stand as you are willing and able for the benediction and our closing hymn. As you go forth, may the light of love shine upon you and out from within you, be gracious unto you, and bring you peace. For this is the day we are given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
Our closing hymn is number 1057, Go Lifted Up. We will sing it through three times. standing. I'm going to teach you a new thing for closing our beautiful ritual. I will say, may it be so, and you will say, and so it is. May it be so, and so it is. That's a wrap. Good job. <laughs>